Okay, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the ZOA Book Club. Um, it's wonderful to see all of you back here. And uh, we have um, a wonderful guest today. Um, Ken Abramowitz will be speaking about the updated version of his, his great book, The uh, Multi-Front War, if you can see it over here. Um, we had Ken speak uh, about this book when it came out in its original form, and there's since been much, much more to write about, which he's added to the book. Um, I guess this is the first time we've had an author who had an, an update book, but this is so important that, um, you know, we thought it was really very worthwhile um, for um, us to have Ken back again to speak about uh, the new, the new, newest version of the book. Um, I know that at the end of the book, um, he speaks about um, what's going on in the campuses very presciently, and uh, we, uh, you know, look forward to you know, perhaps speaking about that today. Um, and I, with no, without any further ado, I will turn this uh, over to Ken. And uh, after Ken speaks for a while, we'll have our questions and answers. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Liz. Uh, it's great to see everybody here today. We're going to have some fun. Uh, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes on um, my book, The Multi-Front War, which is also could have been titled How to Save Western Civilization. Uh, but my editor said, no, we're going to make it the multi-front war. So it is. So I just want to give, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes. So store up your questions. Um, just to give you one minute of history of the book is that uh, I'm a uh, business analyst uh, in the healthcare field for 45 years. And on 9-11, and I, by the way, I work six days a week uh, all the time. And on 9-11, uh, I and everybody else was shocked. And I said to myself, what can I do about this mess? And I said, well, I'm an analyst. So what do analysts do? We, we analyze. So I decided to take one day of my six <clears throat> and devote it to national security. And then I kept spending more time on it. And then I, after about 10 years of teaching myself, I, I realized I should start writing some things. And then it, I realized I should actually write a book. And then I created a book and, and published the book about four years ago called The Multi-Front War. And, um, uh, by the way, during that period of time, I kept spending more and more time on national security. Now I spend about half of my time on uh, national security, half of my time on healthcare analysis. But it's uh, I use similar analysis analytical techniques, and namely, uh, I did this in healthcare, and now I apply it to national security. I create a an imaginary radar screen of all the uh, opportunities and challenges, good guys and bad guys, and uh, in different geographies so that I have a full appreciation of, of what's going on before I have to make a decision, either a decision as an investor in healthcare or, or a decision as a policymaker. I'm not a policymaker, but I pretend that I'm a policymaker. I never had a uh, job in Washington as a policymaker, but I spent a lot of time trying to advise uh, policymakers within any insights that, that I might have. So I just wanted to go through some of the key insights that uh, appeared to me as I kept doing my research on national security. So key insight uh, number one was what I just discussed, to create a broad radar screen, like you might see in the newspaper or if you ever go to the internet or you go to an airport, there's a radar screen of, um, of what, of what's going on. You can even see uh, on TV, a, a meteorologist look, looks at a, a radar screen of, of uh, what storms are, are going where, which direction, how fast, snow, rain, sunny, uh, all those things. So I, I do the same thing, but for national security. So that's insight number one. Uh, insight number two was that there are three groups of bad guys uh, working together to uh, destroy civilization or destroy Western civilization. By the way, Western civilization is just a fancy term for democracy. And about half the people in the world live in a democracy and half live in a dictatorship. 
in this conflict between democracies and dictatorship, I, I call World War Three, but it's it, it's actually World War One. There, there's always been a conflict between uh, we the people and they the elites since the beginning of mankind. So there's elements of World War Three and elements of World War One uh, in it. But the three bad guys I color code, the reds, the greens, and the blues. The um, communists, traditionally color coded red. The Islamists, traditionally colored green for Islam. And the globalists color coded blue for the United Nations color of their um, soldiers' helmets. And, and so these, the reds, the greens, and the blues are the bad guys. And they have declared war on the good guys. I color code good guys or good gals uh, to be yellow for the sunlight of Western civilization, the rule of law, both secular and religious, uh, Old Testament, New Testament, all mixed together. So uh, um, that's the war that we're in, not because we want to be in a state of war, but if the reds, the greens, and blues to, uh, declare war on you, then you're in a state of war. Uh, by the way, the, uh, within the reds, the greens, and the blues, there's actually 17 distinct bad guys. Uh, in round numbers, uh, six are red, six are green, and six are blue. Uh, but just to give you a quick summary, uh, China, Russia would be, and North Korea would be the major, what I call reds, uh, countries. Venezuela, Cuba, among others. Uh, the green countries would be Iran, and on the Shiite side in um, Qatar and Turkey on the Sunni side, uh, they are uh, the Islamists. They're trying to impose Islam on other people. And then the blues would be the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the drug cartels and the social media companies. So uh, but uh, so it, 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 that was insight number two is identifying the bad guys. Uh, insight number three is how do the bad guys fight? Uh, well, uh, what's the definition of war? If you walk down the street and you meet a pedestrian and say, Mr. Pedestrian, what's the definition of war? They'll say, well, things blow up. You know, I saw it in the movies. I, I know everything about war. And well, that's uh, kinetic war, called kinetic war. But you also can fight with chemical biological warfare. COVID, for example, was biological warfare by China against America, killed a million people. A fentanyl is chemical warfare by China against America, killed a million people. Two million Americans are dead in the past 10 years from Chinese chemical and biological attack. And again, you walk down the street and say, Mr. Pedestrian, do you know that two million Americans are dead because of a China chemical, uh, biological chemical attack? I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, number three, you can fight culturally. That's what we primarily do. We're everyone on the phone. Uh, we're, we're all cultural warriors. We don't have uniforms. We we fight with words. Uh, then uh, number four, you can fight with economics, with dollars. And then uh, lawyers, also known as lawfare. You can fight with demographics. The open border is demographic warfare by the federal government against the American people, for example. And then you can fight with cyber. So if you have three bad guys, and they use seven forms of warfare. It comes out to 21 distinct wars that we're fighting in World War III. So that was insight number three. And then I have two more insights, and then I'm going to stop. Uh, insight number four is that if you disaggregate the reds, the greens, and the blues into the 17 uh, distinct countries and organizations, and you multiply the 17 times seven forms of warfare, it comes out to roughly 120, but not every bad guy uses every form of warfare. And so it comes out to 105 wars. You can call them issues or challenges or dilemmas if you want. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, insight number four, was that we're dealing with a situation which is complex be beyond our abilities to manage. So for example, um, if, if, if just pretend that you work for me, and I show up at your office at uh, nine o'clock in the morning, and I say, Mr. Employee working for me, I want you to do 105 things today. You say, Mr. Boss, I'm a human being. I cannot do 105 things today, okay? Now, if you, if you want, if you allocate me a huge budget, 
and come back in six months. And then I'll hire 105 people. And then you ask me to do 105 things. Then I, I can get it done, but not because I'm going to do it all, but because between me and my staff of 105, we could handle the 105 issues that you want us to address today. So it's a, uh, uh, which then leads into my fifth insight was the complexity of managing a multi front war with three bad guys, groups of bad guys, which represent 17 bad guys in seven forms of warfare and 105 wars, I call the, I, I have an analogy, I call them wiffle balls. You imagine you walk into your office or into your house and, 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 and there's various friends there and enemies and they throw 105 wiffle balls in the air and they say, catch. Uh, how, do you, how do you catch 105 wiffle balls? And, and the managerial challenge is, is you have to gear up for that. For example, corporations have 105 challenges or more, uh, but they have a whole management team that handles it. And in World War II, uh, uh, I'm told General George Marshall uh, managed World War II. That was his responsibility. And so um, he, with his staff, would, would uh, and just pretend there were 105 fronts, uh, he, he had a staff capable of managing 105 fronts. And he had direction from the president, FDR, namely to win until unconditional surrender. So you had a structure which was capable of winning World War II. But can you imagine if we were fighting World War II in the president, uh, World War III now, and the president hasn't made a decision that we're in World War III, hasn't made a decision to win World War III, has not hired General George Marshall to manage World War III, you have no chance of winning World War III. I mean, can, can you imagine a football team without a coach or a, a, any team without a coach? I mean, the players are wonderful. They, they're they young and athletic and capable, but uh, you, you need a coach, you need a manager. Like a, 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 a company, uh, Johnson & Johnson, without a president, I mean, it, or without a number two, without a number three, without a whole management structure. So that was my fifth insight when I wrote this book, was that uh, we don't realize we're in World War III, we don't acknowledge it, we haven't made the decision to win it, and we haven't created a management team to execute the desire for victory. So those are my key insights, and I, and I had uh, one huge motivator uh, behind uh, my efforts here, and um, because uh, any of you have written a book, it, it's a huge amount of work and it's a thankless task and you don't get paid for it uh, unless you're you know, someone really, really, really famous. And, and you have to do it just because you want to do it. That's all. You, you want to make a statement. So uh, one of my uh, uh, statements is um, when I look at uh, uh, kids and grandkids, whether my mine, mine or anybody's anywhere. And I look at these wonderful kids and uh, kids are great. Uh, I wish we all had more of them. They, um, I have an affectionate term for them. I call them uh, marshmallows. Uh, they're wonderful kids, but they, 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 they can't manage the complexity of this mess. And, and if uh, my or our generation doesn't figure it out, when we hand the baton of life uh, door by door, door to door, to the children and then the grandchildren, the great grandchildren. These these marshal marshmallows are not up to the task of fighting World War Three. So uh, we we got the country into World War Three. We have to get the country out of World War Three, and uh, that's my uh, key motivator here. So I think I will stop here and uh, see see what else uh, anybody wants to talk about. Well, thank you very much, Ken, for that excellent presentation. And I just wanted to um, invite everybody to uh, ask questions. You can either post your question in the in the chat or in the Q and A, or raise your hand or let let us know in the chat if you'd like to speak live to Ken. Um, and uh, you know, 
meanwhile, uh, you know, there's a, the raise hand function you can use. Um, meanwhile, um, I will, I guess, ask 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 a couple of questions while we're waiting for other people to uh, to raise their hands and, and put their questions in the chat. Um, one of them is towards the end of the book, you um, speak about what's going on on the campuses, which of course is very much in everybody's mind today. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak to that, speak uh, you know about your ideas as to solutions for that. And um, yeah, I'll, please go ahead. Okay, well, I'll mention a few things. Um, uh, of the 17, uh, the reds, the greens, the blues, remember I mentioned that there's 17 bad guys uh, embedded within the reds, greens, and blues, roughly six apiece. Well, uh, within the reds, uh, uh, there is one of the uh, six bad guys within the reds are, are the schools, the K through 12 and the universities. Uh, I call them um, part of the war, uh, part of the cultural war in particular. And uh, and by the way, teachers' colleges, and they are miseducating our K through 12 kids, and then miseducating our university kids. And it reminds me of one of my heroes. I I never met him. I, I met him on YouTube. Uh, KGB defector Yuri Bezmenov. Uh, he was interviewed around 1984. Passed away around 10 years later. He was 50 years old. He passed away 10 years later of a, in quotes, heart attack. But uh, Putin or someone else's <laughs> fingerprints are all over the place. And he said, uh, look, I was a K I'm 50 years old. I was a KGB agent for 25 years. And, and people think the KGB is like the CIA or FBI. That's about 15% correct. But 85% of what the KGB does is we actively intervene in other people's democracies. They have a Russian word for it. I can't pronounce it. It's called active measures. And he says, we actively interfere in your democracy. And after 25 years in the KGB, uh, I didn't like what we were doing. I was ashamed of what we're doing. And I defected to America at huge uh, risk to myself to try to spread the word that you have to protect yourself from the KGB. The KGB, our Russian agents, are invading your teachers' colleges, your elementary schools, and your universities. And he said, if you don't stop them now, this was 1984, by the way, in two generations, which is now, your kids will be communists. You won't know why. You won't know how it happened. You won't be able to talk to them anymore. They'll have a different way of thinking. They will not listen to you. They will not listen to your advice. You can show them facts and they will not be able to absorb them. And he says, stop the KGB now. Well, did anyone listen? No. Did we stop the KGB? No. And so um, so the, 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 uh, this is in the red category. The reds have had a huge deleterious effect uh, on these kids. And now we see these protests, which um, I don't know what percentage of them are paid professional agitators. I saw some numbers at Columbia that 40% of them weren't even students there. So who, who, who paid these people? Who are they working for? And, um, and then, then you have the other 60% or whatever it is, which I call useful idiots, a, a term that I think Lenin and uh, Stalin coined 100 years ago. And, um, and they're marching in the streets on behalf of the Hamas death cult. Now, if I told you 10 years ago that in 10 years, our students are going to have signs that basically, uh, I, I, I hate life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and, and I believe in death cults. Hamas is the death cult of my choice, run by the Iranian death cult, and uh, please join in and help us defeat the evil people in Israel who believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 100% of the population. You would say, "Come on, you, you know you're joking. This, this is, is this in the twilight zone?" And well, that's uh, basically what happened, and and we're in the twilight zone uh, as as a result. Um, so, by the way, this can all be fixed in five minutes. All the if we had a real president, uh, by the way, governors can do this and mayors can do this. All they have to say is, "Look, I'm the mayor. I'm the governor. I'm the president. 
and you're Mr. University head, you're getting money from my government. And, and if you allow anti-Semitism and anti-Christian behavior on your campus starting in five minutes, I'm gonna cut off all the finance. Have a nice day. And, and by the way, if you wanna get your financing back, here's a 10 point plan that you have to adopt. And whenever you adopt it, I'll, I'll send the money again. But until you uh, uh, follow this 10 point plan, forget it. That'll fix the problem in five minutes. Yep. Uh, also, I, I would like to see, I went to Columbia and, and I had a dream that the uh, FBI, if we had a real FBI, um, went to the president's office, handcuffed her and took her out uh, for providing a material support for terrorism. By, by not shutting down these lunatics within five minutes. and But that was a dream and then I woke up. Uh, but it would be nice to make an example of one university president and then send shivers to the other universities. Also, I, I would arrest uh, one of their board members and, uh, and that'll send a shiver through all, all the other board members and, and donors too. Um, so those are my quick comments on these, on the schools. Yeah. Um, by by the way, the uh, ZOA is uh, just uh, put together a very lengthy um, letter to a very detailed letter to Christopher Ray, the FBI director, and to Merrick Garland, the AG, and Chris, Kristen uh, Clark, who is the assistant AG for civil rights, about uh, taking a lot more effective language, uh, yeah, m m a lot more eff effective uh, um steps against uh, the anti-Semitism and, and the violence on the ca college campuses and, you know, and, and including uh, invoking uh, Title VI, Title VII, and the, uh, you know, the uh, federal criminal laws against giving material support, providing material support to terrorism. And in, in that letter we go through, it's just shocking uh, case after case on uh, or school after school and what's going on there and the violence going on in, in, in so many schools across the country. Um, so, you know, watch out for that. We'll probably put that out today in this open letter and, and uh, or, you know, probably at the latest by tomorrow. Um, yeah. A anything you can do to embarrass them is good because they're not doing their job. Uh, absolutely. They all, they, they all should be fired. Ab absolutely. Um, so we have a lot of questions now. Um, in the Q&A, and so I'm going to uh, uh, start asking some of them. Um, let's see, okay, so Madeline Zellman is asking, what about the bad guys who reside in this terrible country that they hate and, and do all they can to undermine and destroy this country? Terrible, it's, you know, she's being sarcastic. Some are professional activists, some are university students, and some are in our government, and, and uh, we already discussed a little bit about the, uh, the, the campuses, but uh, I guess you know, you know, maybe you want to deal with the uh, governmental part of that question. Sure. Uh, the uh, you remember the the movie Alice in Wonderland, and you remember the the Queen of Hearts. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what would what would the Queen of Hearts say at a time like this? Off with their heads. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So we, we we don't do that anymore. I mean, the bad guys do it, but good guys we don't we don't do that. But but we you can fire people. You don't. Know? have to separate their head from the rest of their body. But uh, in one of the campuses, they had a um, uh, a sort of a mock trial of uh, the university president, provost and, uh, and and board of directors, and they found them all guilty. And then they, then they were screaming guillotine, guillotine, guillotine. The, the, these are the, the campus radicals doing this. Yeah. Now, now, the irony is we don't use guillotines anymore. Uh, the French did couple hundred years ago or so. But uh, the the irony is, is they're right, but for the wrong reason. <laughs> they, they, they should uh, dismiss or fire uh, the, the president because they allowed Looney Tunes like that loose on the campus without putting them in insane asylums uh, or in jail for providing material support for terrorism. So so they, they were half right that the president uh, should be in jail, but they just had the wrong reason. The, the, the real reason is that they allowed lunatics out of the insane asylum, paid professional terrorists, who to, and then the question is who was paying them, uh, those people should be in jail too. But the fingerprints of all of our enemies are, are apparent here. I, I, I see um, Russian fingerprints, Chinese fingerprints, Iranian fingerprints, Qatari Muslim Brotherhood fingerprints, 
uh, Democrat Party fingerprints. Uh, there's uh, socialist fingerprints, Soros fingerprints, uh, Ford Foundation. So I can't tell you who's financing these lunatics. Uh, there was also a recent article in the Wall Street Journal saying that Biden's donors were uh, key to uh, this insurrection. So this is all phony insurrection, contrived insurrection, because uh, the Biden team decided that chaos in the streets is good for his reelection. Now, the thesis of my book in the, the last chapter was that the Democrats are going to end up electing Trump. So you say, wait, wait a minute, you mean Democrats elect Democrats? Why would Democrats elect Trump? Because by pulling stunts like this, by creating chaos with, um, uh, 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 I forecasted five terror organizations, uh, Black Lives Matter, which is black uh, uh, racist. Then there's um, Antifa, which are Chinese communist uh, loonies. And then now we're watching the Islamic uh, lunatics and or the Islamists. And then I'm, I'm looking for the drug cartels to set up a terror organization and for the Chinese to set up a terror organization. So, uh, so far we see three of the terror organizations. I'm waiting for another two. And, and I think the Democrats have a theory that this chaos in the streets will cause, uh, they'll blame Trump for it. But the irony is, is Biden's president, not Trump. So I think Biden's going to get blamed for the chaos, not Trump. And that, uh, so this chaos is going to get Trump elected. Uh, that was one of the uh, thoughts uh, in the last chapter of the book. The last chapter of the book was a 2024 update. And anyone who gets the book should immediately go to, to the last chapter and read the last chapter. Uh, by, the, by the way, the, the book is, is $20. And it's the, the biggest gift you ever got in your life. I have a joke to myself that only cost me $400 of my time and energy to produce a book that I sell for $20. So so you're you're really buying a $400 book for $20, which is like the biggest bargain you ever uh, had in your life. Okay, um, the next question is from Sergio um, Hoyman. Um, Sergio says, thank you for your very informative presentation. I noticed you haven't used the term globalists when referring to the UN and the, and the WF. WEF World Economic Forum. Why? Uh, oh, I, I just, I, I guess, I guess I forgot. Yeah. So it's the communists, the Islamists, and the globalists. And and I use the UN as a um, model uh, of the globalists, uh, but it doesn't include. And I color coded blue uh, for the UN colors. But yes, it also includes the World Economic Forum, uh, the uh, the drug cartels, and the social media companies. I put them uh, in the blue category. Now, by the way, there's certain characteristics that the reds and the blues that have in common with each other. Uh, they're all criminal organizations. They're all unelected. In contrast to normal people who believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 100% of the population, they believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 10% of the population, namely themselves. And they hate God. They hate the Bible. They hate the Constitution and Bill of Rights. They hate the rule of law because they want to be God. They want to create the rule of law. And uh, and I have a special word for, for them. I call them pagans. The reds, the greens, and the blues are modern day pagans. And I have an article coming on my website. Everyone should sign up for my website, savethewest.com. Uh, I write an article every two weeks and you'll get the article. Uh, I just wrote an article on the campuses, so you'll see that like now. But uh, if you sign up today, you'll get future articles. And uh, 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 I'm working on, uh, I always work on like 10 articles at the same time. But the, the next one coming is going to be called Two-State Solution is Illogical for Israel but Coming to America. It's basically uh, the country splits apart. And uh, and I have another article coming soon after that will be called Revenge of the Pagans. I'm going to describe the reds, the greens, and the blues, explain why they're pagans. And they've been um, angry at Judaism for 3,800 years, angry at Christianity for uh, 2,000 years. And now here is their time for revenge, uh, so to speak. And so we're fighting the war of our great, 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 great grandparents in uh, biblical times. Uh, against the pagans, 
And another affectionate word I have for the reds, the greens, the blues are the Amalekites. Mm. So what else do we have, Liz? Okay, um, Deborah Glazer um, has the following question, um, very, very interesting. Uh, why not set up competing safe spaces for Jews and Zionists in the dining halls, dorms, etc.? cetera, demand that they be protected 24 seven by campus police, if the illegal Hamas encamp encampments are allowed to remain, then these separate safe spaces for Jews need to remain also. And, you know, if I can take a second to um, to mention something about that, uh, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a great idea. But one of the things that's happening on the campuses is, is that uh, the um, Islamists are specifically targeting what should be Jewish safe spaces, such as the Hillel houses, and you know if there's an event for Jewish students and, and they'll set up their encampments and their demonstrations right there, try to break into them, vandalize them, and so on. So um, you know what you know what would normally be safe spaces for Jewish students are are being invaded and 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 defaced and and uh, you know <laughs> running into a lot of problems. Um, anyway, now, uh, please Ken, go ahead. Now bear in mind. 2% uh, of Americans are Jewish and 90% are Christians. So we need safe spaces for the 2% and the 90% <laughs> because the 8%, the other 8% are criminals. So how do we do this in the world, real, real world? We have people uh, with uniforms called policemen. We have judges who have robes and the policemen arrest the criminals and bring them in front of a judge who then sends them to a jail. So what's happening is our legal system's not working anymore. Uh, the uh, concept of equal protection under the law has gone by the wayside because basically the criminals have taken over the government. So the government is criminals. So it's not surprising that it, pretend, uh, you know, if the government's criminals, then I walk up to some official in the government, either federal or state, and I say, uh, Mr. Official, uh, we have to save the 92% of the people from the 8% of the people who are criminals. And the criminal says, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't, I don't want to save the 92% of the people from the 8% who are criminals because I'm a criminal and I want to steal their houses and their property. And, um, and so I'm not going to protect the other 92%. That's what's going on. Essentially, uh, the criminal class, which I call reds, greens, and blues, also known as the Malachites and also known as pagans, have taken over the federal government and about uh, uh, roughly half of the state governments, and they're protecting the criminals. They're not protecting the uh, the law-abiding citizens, and uh, it's a scandal of biblical proportions. And uh, you know, if they kept writing the Bible, we'd still be in the we we they'd be writing a chapter on us. Yeah, that, I mean, it's a good it's a good point because on the campuses, it's not just the Jewish students that are affected. It's the you know all well, the other students who want to get an education, whose uh, you know whose lives have been disrupted, who also can't get to class, and who also uh, have had their exams exams moved and had their uh, commencements that they worked for for four years canceled, and um, you know had their lives disrupted too. It's it's it's. You know, a lot of people need safe spaces on the campuses. By the way, so, so do Muslims. I mean, there's two groups of Muslims. The mm -hmm. Islamists, who uh, should be in jail, and, and the, uh, the, the Muslims who just treat Islam as a religion, but not as a political movement, they also want, want to pass their exams. They also want to get a degree, and they also want to do what the other 92% of the population wants to do. So uh, these uh, Islamists are an enemy of Jews, Christians, Hindus, and Muslims simultaneously. Okay, Elizabeth Hoover asks, so what do you think we should do today to help our president get on the right path? <laughs> this, uh, well, you know, this is not a political discussion, so I, I don't want to make it a political discussion, but uh, the, the, um, Basically, the government has to be fired. The, the, the government has uh, certain responsibilities. It has to protect us from uh, all enemies, foreign and domestic. It's not protecting us from any enemies, foreign and domestic. And the government's also responsible for protecting the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of everybody. And they're not doing it. So the government is basically, if I were a professor rating the federal government uh, or half of the state governments, they get an F. So 
just as if you got F's in schools, they, they'd expel you at a certain time or you'd expel yourself. You say, why, why am I spending, you know, $70,000 a year to get F's? You know, you'll, you'll leave on your own volition. But um, they, they, they had their chance and, and, and they have to be fired. And by the way, in a democracy, we fire our uh, government officials every two, four, six years, depending upon who you are. And uh, so uh, it, it's time to fire them. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. We have some other comments here. Um, let's see. David Goldfarb says, please send your book to Mark Levin. I would love it to get a bigger audience. Um, Ira Berkowitz uh, says, I think that Israel understands that civilizational war is ongoing. Bibi Netanyahu frequently makes direct reference to the concept that Israel is at the tip of the spear. What other countries might you be able to name that are on board with fighting back? Well, uh, there's a, uh, just under 200 countries in the world and uh, about 125, the last time I calculated, were generally Christian countries and uh, one Jewish country and one Hindu country. And uh, Japan is, uh, I guess you'd call them a Shinto country. And um, uh, all of these countries are under existential threat from the uh, two thirds of the countries that are in the half of the, which represent half of the people who have declared war. Um, so uh, China, Russia, Iran, Qatar, Turkey have declared war on us. So we're, we're in war. Now, if you go back in the time, 1400 years ago, half of the Christian world was lost to the Muslims because the Christian world didn't defend itself. But the, the Middle East was Christian, not Muslim. And the Muslims just killed the Christians. And, um, and, and the few Jews that were in Israel at that time, or Palestine then, until the uh, Arabs uh, pretended that they're, they're, they're Palestinians. And uh, so who's best able to do it? Well, it, Israel's right on the front lines. So Israel's fighting for its life. And, and, and by the way, you would think that the other democracies would send the equivalent of thank you notes to Prime Minister Netanyahu, whether it's in Europe or Latin America or North America, saying, or, or half of Africa, saying thank you so much for protecting us from the I Islamist uh, pagans. Uh, who are, are trying to kill all the Jews and then go on to kill all the Christians and then all the Hindus. Uh, we appreciate your efforts so much. We're going to send you more money, more arms. You don't need our soldiers. You have wonderful soldiers. Okay, but we're going to send you the resources you need to fight the Islamists, and, uh, which is Iran and its proxy of 500,000 worldwide terrorists. We're going to help you because you're fighting for us. Your war is our war. Now, how many thank you notes has Israel got? Now, countries don't send thank you notes, but just pretend that they do. Like, no, nobody. Uh, so, and, and America is now ambivalent because our government is basically funding Israel and Iran at the same time. You know, you can't make this stuff up. But I would say the countries in Eastern Europe, the ones who used to live under Soviet dictatorship, uh, people like Hungary and uh, Poland, uh, they, they know the story and uh, they're fighters. And um, and America should be a fighter. Uh, Canada's on its way to become an Islamist country. And uh, Mexico's on its way to become a, a drug cartel country. So uh, uh, Brazil could have been a hope, but, but uh, the communists uh, took over. And uh, Argentina, no one cares about Argentina, but it's coming to life under the leadership of a normal person. So th there's, I, I would say there's no more than 10 countries in the democracies that are willing to fight. And, and by the way, th there's, there's a number of Muslim countries that are willing to fight. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, uh, the Emirates, uh, uh, they're willing to fight because they don't want to be taken over by the Islamists. <laughs> they, they, don't, they have no tolerance for this nonsense. By the way, Saudi Arabia used to be an Islamist country, but under the leadership of uh, Mohammed bin Salman, also known as MBS, uh, he led a huge reformation of that country to try to make it um, 
joined the no normal modern world. So I'd say there's about 10 countries that, uh, well, all the countries know they're fighting for their lives, but only 10 countries are willing to fight uh, for their lives. Thank you. Um, discouraging, but uh, you know, we have to stand strong. Um, Greta, our friend Greta Rafsky asks, who is it up to to start to manage opposition to the wars? Where is the central command fighting for our civilization? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I have an expression at times like this, uh, that where's Mighty Mouse? <laughs> remember, does everyone remember Mighty Mouse? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess it depends what generation uh, you're, you're in, but um, uh, Mighty Mouse, uh, the cartoon character, was here to save the day. So the the question is, who, who's who's going to be here to save the day? Well, uh, you have to have the the, the Jews and the Christians, uh, Judeo Judeo Christian uh, civilization has to save itself. And um, and as I said, uh, Judeo-Christian civilization lost half of its civilization fourteen hundred years ago to to the uh, Islamists uh, through the sword because they didn't defend themselves. Turkey was a Christian country; they didn't fight. Uh, it, well, they fought, but they they got out out fought. Uh, but you when you fight, you're supposed to win. Um, so. Uh, I have an article coming. It's time for the Western world to make its final stand. This is a, this is a historic time. We have to make a final stand to survive. Uh, otherwise, we'll be taken over by reds, greens, and the blues. And uh, think of it as a coalition government. So that there'll be certain com communists, certain Islamists, and certain globalists who will be running our lives. <laughs> now, uh, maybe 90% of the people won't know the difference. <laughs> Uh, but 10%, maybe 20% of the people will say, I, I don't want the government running my life. Uh, they're corrupt and they're just stealing my money and putting it in their own pockets. <laughs> but um, we're, we're halfway to the destruction of America. We'll be a, a, a basically a colony of, of China, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and the, the World Economic Forum. It's a sad situation. And that's why we have to make our final stand right now. And November 5th, I would say, will be our final stand. Okay. Um, Paulette um, Macquarie asks, what are your thoughts on Ukraine? Well, the thesis of the book is that when you're fighting bad guys, not because you want to fight, because they want to fight you, <laughs> you have to fight all the bad guys simultaneously. You, you, you. It's not like a menu. You know, you go to a restaurant, you know, vegetables, chicken, and dessert, or whatever. Uh, you have to fight all fronts all the time because all the bad guys are working together. So if you don't fight on one of the fronts, you energize the bad guys to fight more seriously on the other fronts. So you have to be tough everywhere. So if, if Russia wants to take over eastern Ukraine and then the rest of Ukraine and then the rest of Europe, you say, no, I'm going to make my final stand right now in eastern Ukraine, because if I don't, I mean, there will be. You want to fight in Poland, or you want to wait till fight in France? Wait, 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 where, where do you want to make your final stand? So my my point is, we want to make our final stand wherever we are. So where, wherever the the war is, uh, geographically, that's our final stand. So uh, Russia can't take any more of Ukraine, and we will provide the resources to help the Ukraine. They're not asking for our soldiers. They're just asking for money and, and uh, weapons, just sort of like Israel. So we have to do everything to help Ukraine fight the Reds. We have to do everything to help Israel fight the Greens. And uh, we have to help the universities and the corporations fight off the blues that are trying to take over those organizations. Okay, um, Arnold Pakman has a question and I, I want to preface this by uh, reminding people that uh, ZOA is a nonprofit, and so we don't endorse um, candidates for election. Although you know, we certainly speak about issues and positions and that sort of thing, but you know, not we don't tell people who to vote for. Um, anyway, uh, Arnold Pakman uh, asks, 
Uh, considering how bad democratic policies have proven to be for Israel and Jews, do you think American Jews are finally ready to vote for a Republican president, even if it is Trump? Well, bear something in mind. The, the Democrat Party is not the Democrat Party. About uh, 15 years ago, it was taken over by the Reds, the Greens, and the Blues. They cleverly kept the name Democrat Party. But if uh, uh, John F. Kennedy could come back to life, and and we spend a day, pretend and we can spend a day with him. He'd say, "What? Who who will who allowed our our party to get taken over by by our foreign enemies? Shouldn't be that way." Uh, but it was. So the um, but half of the people don't realize that half the people think the Democrat Party is actually the Democrat Party. They don't think of it as the Communist Party or the Islamist Party or the Globalist Party or a coalition of the Reds, the Greens, and the Blues. So they're voting uh, uh, for tradition because they always voted for Democrats. And then they didn't spend enough time learning that the Democrats they were voting for are not the Democrats that are there now. Uh, a, uh, a notable author from New Zealand, Trevor Loud, uh, wrote a, a book on um, the enemy within. And he categorized that of the 215 roughly Democrat congressmen in DC, a hundred of them are card carrying communists, either now or in their past. So a hundred out of 215, that's like almost roughly 40% of the Democrat representatives in Washington are communists and there and should have been disqualified from running. Yeah, I just heard him speak recently. He said, we don't um, our, our congressmen don't have to pass national security clearance. It's not like if you had a job in the government, you'd have to pass national security clearance. No one's doing national security clearance on them. He says about um, uh, uh, half of the Democrat senators and 40% uh, of the representatives are communists. Never should have been allowed to run. They couldn't possibly pass a national security exam a lie test, lie detector test. So, um, so it confuses a lot of people. And then what they do, which is wasn't done so much by historical enemies, <laughs> is they're, they're so good, uh, aided by KGB techniques. What they do is they take the bad things that they're doing and project them onto the good people. So when, when people say, oh, I hate Trump, I hate Trump. I say, why do you hate, oh, I hate him, I hate him, I hate him. By the way, the same thing they do is play the same game in Israel. Oh, I hate Bibi. I hate Bibi. Why do you hate Bibi? Give me three reasons. Oh, I hate him. I hate him. Just give me three reasons. They can't do it. And the three reasons, if I press them, the three reasons that they give me are all communist false narr narrative propaganda. So the people who are not supporting Trump, are, are, are um, their minds have been taken over by the Reds, the Greens, and the Blues. They're not thinking for themselves. They are uh, basically become robots uh, for, for the KGB. If, if Yuri Bezmenov came back to life, he said, like, you morons, I told you this in 1984, you got to stop the commies. And you didn't do it. You didn't listen to me. And uh, so we're, we're, we're suffering from all those uh, false narratives. By the way, the real negatives against Trump, they're never in the newspaper. You know, when someone says to me, oh, I don't like Trump for this reason, that reason, I said, those are all baloney reasons. That's Democrat false narrative. I said, you, you want some real reasons to not like Trump? He promised to build a wall and he didn't finish it. He finished 98% of a, of a wall or a fence in our southern border. But you promised to deliver a, a, a fence, a wall. You had to assume you're only going to be president for four years. You never know about the second four years. It should have been done. Why wasn't it done? That's a legitimate criticism of Trump. Never shows up in the newspaper. Another, uh, just a final point in 30 seconds. He said, uh, we're gonna bankrupt Iran with maximum pressure. He never bankrupted Iran because he didn't provide maximum pressure for enough time to bankrupt. So there are legitimate criticisms of Trump, but the people who aren't voting for Trump never use a legitimate criticism. They always use a communist false narrative. Well, I think I, I, I think he did. He brought uh, Iran's um, 
reserves down to about four billion dollars from a hundred yeah, yeah. billion. Yeah, for, he, right. he, he close to bankrupted them, and you know, I think I think he he says regarding the wall that you know he was kind of, the litigation um, about uh, putting up the wall was what delayed it, you know, which was really important. You know, the, all the lawfare about the wall, uh, but right. anyway, um, you know, that's the other side of this. Um, we also have, I think we have time for one final question. And this is the, the name of the person is listed as anonymous attendee. And he asks, or he or she asks, um, how about reviving the Jewish Defense League? Well, it, 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 it's sad. Uh, if, if the government's not going to protect you, you have to protect yourself. So I had a joke 10 years ago. This was not meant to be a funny joke. It was like a sad joke. I said uh, 10 years ago. In 10 years, we're all going to be living in a John Wayne movie. Remember John Wayne, you know, with the holster and, and the two, two uh, uh, guns in, in, in the holster. And well, in Israel right now, Israel's living in a John Wayne movie. You know, I, I, I meet friends for dinner. There, there's the gun bulging out of their back pocket. And, um, and so uh, Israel's now in a John Wayne movie. So in America, it's just a question of time. I would say the Democrat states, the roughly 24 of them, uh, they're going to be in a John Wayne movie. and Or they're going to move to the other 26 states so that they can live like uh, normal Americans. And uh, th that's why they want to take our guns away so that we won't be... By the way, all dictatorships want to take guns away because they realize the number one enemy of the country is the people, uh, not the, the domestic people, not, not the outside enemies. Um, by the way, regarding that, I keep hearing about um, a lot of Jewish people, um, you know, more and more Jews uh, going for firearms training. Um, it's interesting, you know, that this is, you know, especially in the last year. Anyway. Um, uh, but by the way, I'll, I'll, if you have just 30 seconds, I'll alert people to the one of the troubles with having your own gun is we're not professionals. Uh, in Israel, there's lots of soldiers or former soldiers or policemen. They're professionals. We're, we're not professionals. And, and we, we can hurt ourselves. And, and at the same time, there is a company called Byrna, B-Y-R-N-A, that sells pellet guns. There, there's no gunpowder. It's carbon dioxide powered. Uh, they don't kill anybody. Uh, they just uh, can threaten a bad guy with a, a nasty pellet, uh, so to speak. So those of you who might be thinking about getting a gun, think about a non-lethal gun, because then you won't get yourself into trouble by it, it killing or hurting somebody, uh, good or bad, or, or yourself. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. Okay, before I um, give you a minute for final remarks, um, I would like to announce um, another book club, which um, we are having. Um, it's uh, The book is called Escape from Dachau, um, you know, an incredible story um, by one of the relatives involved in this. Um, and, uh, She's going to be speaking to us on the 22nd uh, of May. So um, I think Jackie has already put the uh, the link to sign up uh, in the um, in the chat. And so I hope a lot of to see a lot of you there. Um, and uh, Ken, if you'd like uh, if you'd like to give us any final remarks, um, you know, please do so. And again, thank you everybody for joining us. It's wonderful to see you and. Uh, Hope everybody had a good pace off and is doing as well as, as possible with, in these difficult times. Ken? Well, uh, I wanted to thank uh, ZOA for inviting me here. And thank Liz for having me here. Uh, I, I always enjoy talking uh, to people and in, in organizations that are doing good things because it, it uh, my ideas can, uh, it, it takes, it's very time consuming to talk to 50 or 100 people individually. So it's good to have a nice group of people together. Uh, I'm happy to help. If, if um, I target to give over 100 speeches a year, this year I'll probably give 150. If, uh, if the other of you want to do webinars somewhere for uh, other friends that you have or organizations that you're affiliated with or local ZOA chapters, and uh, you can always call on me because I devote three days a week, half of my time in public service to help uh, educate myself and then ed educate uh, everybody else as to the challenges that we face. Thank you so much, Ken, and thank you, everybody. It was great to see you, and I hope to see you in two weeks on May 22nd um, for a very, you know, to discuss a very fascinating book that um, 
you know, they can give us give us some hope, even in the most dire situations. Thank thank you, Ken, for all, all of your words of wisdom. Take care. Okay. Pleasure. All the best. Bye -bye. Thanks.